Hello, and welcome back to this Blender Beginner series. Today we'll be exploring the world of materials and textures to give our boring gray mug color and realism. If you're new here, don't forget to hit that subscribe button, and let's get started. First, if you successfully followed part one, you should have something like this. To bring this mug to something colorful and shiny, I'll start by heading to the shading tab up here at the top. Last time we did all of our work in the layout tab, which is where most people do their modeling. But the shading tab is where all of the work with materials is done. Here I'm going to hit this new button down here, and what this will do is create a new material for our object. First though, I should explain what a material actually is. In Blender, materials are almost like paintings, where the finished work of art is what your object looks like with your material applied to it. Paintings are made with multiple brushes, and materials are the same. Instead of brushes, materials have things called nodes, but both contribute to a piece of the painting slash material. Nodes mix different parts of the material together to create the final result. Right now we only have two the principal BSDF, and the material output. The principal BSDF is a shaders node. Shaders calculate how light interacts with your object. The material output node takes your final shader and defines how your material should be outputted. For now, we'll focus more on the shader. Inside it, you can see different options or parameters. These change how light interacts with your object. For example, if I click on the white rectangle next to base color, I can change the color of my object. But real quickly, I'm going to zoom in on my object by hitting the tilde key, then hitting the 3 key. And what this does is allow us to pivot around our object smoothly and cleanly. So back to the mug, I'll leave the base color white, and I'll just do that by hitting Control-Z. And I'll add some other values as well. So for the roughness, I'm going to bring that down to maybe 0.1. It doesn't have to be exactly 0.1, just near there. And what that does is smooth out the objects, which allows for better reflection. And most mugs are generally not rough. And then I'll also bring the metallic up a little bit, maybe also, maybe around actually 0.2. And what that does is bring out the reflections a little bit more. You can see if I brought it all the way up, it's like a mirror, but I'll just leave it at 0.2 for now. And that should be it for the shader. So with the shader complete, going back to the painting analogy, we've changed what our canvas looks like. But what about the details the brushes make? A lot of mugs have some form of art on them. To add that, we can add what's called a texture to our object. Textures are the equivalent of adding painted detail to the canvas. But before we do that, we need to understand three things, UVs, inputs, and outputs on nodes. When you put a texture on an object, Blender creates a 2D representation of that object's faces, which, using a cube as an example, looks like this. It unwraps your object's faces onto a 2D plane. Then it stamps the image onto them and rewraps them, giving you an object with a texture. When your object is unwrapped, the X and Y coordinates of your image are, mar are matched with Blender's U and V of your faces, which are the same as X and Y just in Blender. Next, with inputs and outputs, I like to think of nodes as machines that take one thing in, an input, do something with it, and give you back something else, an output. For example, our shader node takes inputs like roughness and color and gives back a functional shader as an output. So, to add a texture to our object, start by hitting Shift A like we did in the last video. Next, search for image texture. And left click on that, drag it over here, and left click again to confirm. Here we've created an image texture node which outputs the color values of an image we choose. To actually get that image, hit open. And I apologize because I cannot record my file explorer, but we're going to go over here to our Blender logo. We're going to open that. But then after opening it, nothing happens. That's because we need to connect the output of the image texture to the color input in your shader. What this does is use that pre-made unwrapped version of your object to connect the texture to your object. But right now our UV map, which is another word for the 2D representation of the object, is unwrapped wrong resulting in this mess. This is because when we created our cylinder, Blender gave it an automatic UV map, which was good for a cylinder, but as we made changes to the cylinder, Blender didn't change the UV map, so we still have the map for a cylinder. To fix this, I'm going to introduce another workspace called UV Editing, which is at the top. When you click on it, you'll see two main windows, a viewport on the right, and your Blender logo or the UV editing area to the left. If you don't see that, go back to the shading tab, select your image texture, and return to UV editing. On top of the image, you should see a UV map with ver in vertices, edges, and faces that correspond to your object. But if you're like me and don't see any of these, just hover over the viewport, hit the A key to select every face, and now they should be over here. Even though there aren't things we added here, like the handle, we don't need to worry about that because we don't need to put anything on those changed areas. So here the solution is simple. First, I'm going to disable the subdivision surface modifier, which can be done by going to the wrench icon on the right and clicking the little monitor. And what this does is reduce lag. 
Next, just like in edit mode on your object, I'm hovering over the UV editing area, and I'm going to hit A to select every face on my UV map. Then I'll hit G to move them, again like in regular edit mode. And just to be precise, I'll hit the Y key while scaling and while moving to move them along the Y axis of the image, or straight up and down, to about here, so that it's in the middle of that sideways area. I'll left click and I'll left click to confirm, and the UV editing process is complete. To see the changes, I'll go back to the modifier tab and click the monitor icon again to see the modifier. Next, I'll go back to the shading workspace, and our logo is on the mug. But it does look a bit funny, so I'll go back to the UV editing tab, and first I'll click on this top bar with my mouse wheel and drag everything to the right. And this is the top bar up here. There's a lot of top bars, so don't get confused. And then you'll see these circles over here, and I'll select the third one. And what that does is enable shading so that we can see our mug with the logo. And then I'll go over to the UV editing area, and I'll still have all the faces selected. Hit S, and this time hit X while I'm scaling to scale them along the sideways axis. Oh, and I forgot to turn off the modifier, so it's a little bit laggy. But I'll maybe do it to about there, and our Blender logo is looking much better. Next, I'll go back to the shading tab, and our material is finished. Now there's only one thing left to do, generate your final image or render your mug as it's properly called. To start, I'm going to go back to the layout tab to create a table service to render our mug on, so it's not floating midair. Next, I'll hit Shift A to create a plane, and I'll hit G after creating the plane, and the Z key right after to move it down along the Z axis, because you can see it's buried in our cup right now. So I'll move it until I see the bottom of the cup, and then a little bit up, like that. Perfect. Now the only thing left to do is make a material for it as well, so we don't have our mug on a gray plane. So now, after already making a material, this one should be much quicker. Again, I'm going to go to the shading tab, and hit new to create a new material for our plane. Be aware that the plane has to be selected to create the new material. Next, I'm going to hit shift A to create an image texture. And I'll drag that to about here. Then I'll hit open and select this wood texture, which I have in the comments. And mind that it's base color, not normal or roughness. I'll drag the color output to the color input of the shader, and our material may look done, but there's a way to make it much more realistic, and that is with making what's called a PBR material. PBR materials are mainly used for making photorealistic materials. To start making one, hit Shift A again to make another image texture, and I'll drag it down here. Next, hit open and select the wood roughness texture from the description. If you opened that outside of Blender, you'd see a black and white version of wood. Commonly, these kinds of images are called roughness maps, and that's because they give Blender a sort of map of where to make parts of your object more rough and other parts less rough. To demonstrate what they can do, connect the image texture to the gray input dot next to roughness. When an image is connected to the roughness input of a shader, Blender uses the image almost as a key. Where the image is white, Blender makes your object more rough, and where the image is dark, Blender makes your object less rough. And the way Blender knows where on the object to do that based on the images, like with color, from your UVs. Sometimes people get similar black or white images to connect to values like specular or metallic, but roughness is usually good without needing any others. Finally, and this is my favorite part, hit Shift A again to create another image texture, and I'll also navigate, and if I didn't say already with my mouse wheel, and I'll move that down there because we're going to put our image texture down here. So I'll hit Shift A, create an image texture, and I'll do that. And then hit Open and find Wood Normal. Unlike the roughness map, this is a mainly purple image if you open it outside of Blender. But Blender reads this in a similar way. Normal maps create the illusion of bumps and crevices on your object without creating hundreds or even thousands of little faces to do the same thing. To achieve this, the normal map is purple where parts of your texture face up, red where it faces left, green where it faces forward, and so on. Blender reads these colors and shades your object appropriately. To connect this to the shader, hit Shift A, and this time search for normal map. Normal map. And I'll put that down here. And now connect the color output from your image texture to the color input of the normal map, and connect the normal output from your normal map to the normal input of the shader over here. And now you can see that our texture it looks like it has more depth. Now your PBR material is done. Now it's time to actually render. On the same toolbar where you had modifiers, look for this camera icon at the top. Click on it and you'll be brought to the render settings. 
Normally, I don't touch maybe 90% of this jumble of buttons and text, but the only things I do change are the render engine and a few other properties. Right now, our render engine up here is set to EV. I'll go ahead and click the drop down and select Cycles. This render engine does a much better job with photorealistic results, but it is slower. So when you do render your mug, I recommend doing it overnight as it can take a while. I'll also select the CPU dropdown and change that to GPU compute. And what this does is use your graphics card, not your CPU. Next, to see what it looks like rendered, I'll go back to the layout tab for a better view. And up here, I'll click the fourth sphere at the top. This, trigger, this triggers render preview mode. The reason it's so pixelated is because Blender is actually sending a single light ray for each pixel. Depending on your computer, it might render fast or slow. But getting back to your final render, we have to move the camera, which you can think of as sort of what takes the picture that is the final render. To do that, click the camera icon up here on your Gizmos panel. But you can see that it's really zoomed out. And to fix that, we can hit the N key, which I'll do a few times so you can see. And that'll open our sidebar over here. I'll go to View on this side and click where it says Lock, Camera to, and then if I expand it a little bit, Camera to View. And now we can actually pivot around our viewport inside our camera, because if I did not select that, our camera would be exited every time I tried to look around. So then I'll zoom in. And if I want to ever get out of camera view, I'll just click the camera icon up here in the gizmos again. And now I can just set up the camera, I'll maybe put it around there somewhere. But there's still one more thing to do before the final render to hone it to perfection. Go back to the render properties tab up here, the camera on your sidebar and go down to View Transform under Color Management, which is at the very bottom. So over here, View Transform, I'm going to change Filmic to Filmic Log. I could go into a whole explanation of what this changes, but I'll summarize. On something like an iPhone camera, things that are really bright or dark clip into pure white or pure black on any photo. Blender is like that, but even worse, because by default it provides a very limited tonal range in your render. Changing to Filmic Log increases that tonal range beyond that of even a DSLR camera. But when you change to Filmic Log, it makes it a little too dull in my opinion. So to fix that, I can lower the exposure down here and even bring the gamma down a little bit, which increases the contrast a little bit. So maybe I'll bring it to about there probably. Finally, I'll exit camera view with this button up here. I'll go into my theme collection hierarchy thing and select my light. I'll go into top view, which I already did, by clicking the Z. Then I'll hit G to grab the light and move it, and I'll move it closer to the cup. Then I'll go back into camera view. But that looks a little bit bright. You can see how everything is too dull, I guess. So I'm going to go into the light. I'm going to this little light bulb down here. And note that your light has to be selected for it to show up, or else it won't. I'll click it, and I'll bring the power down to around 500 watts. I can also just type 500. There we go. And then I also just might go back into the top view by clicking the camera icon. Move it a little closer. Go back. Again, move it a little closer. I'll also move it down because it's way up here. And now it looks really bright, so I'll bring the power down even more. And that should be good. And now after everything, we should be done. Before I do the final render, I'll select the plane, hit G. And while I'm moving, hit Shift Z at the same time, and these red and green lines should appear, which means you're moving it sideways along every axis except for Z, which is up and down. And I'll move it so it covers my view, and then once you see at the bottom that it starts to go out of your view, I'll move it back so that the whole camera view is over the wood. And then you can see it up here, there's still a little bit left, so I'll just angle my camera down. And now our red box, which is our camera, is inside the view, so that looks good. And if you really want to, you can select the cube in the, not the cube, the mug, hit shift D to duplicate it. And it's going to be laggy because the rendering is now rendering two mugs. I'm going to hit shift Z again to move it along every axis except for the Z. And I'll put it around there. I'll hit the R key to rotate it. Hit the Z key to rotate it around the Z axis. And I'll maybe put it there. Now, hopefully being the final key, you'll click in this tutorial, hit F12. And if you don't have that on your keyboard, just go up here to render and hit render image and wait for your final render to finish. To export it when it's done, go up here to image and hit save as. Mine is grayed out right now because I haven't rendered it. It hasn't finished rendering yet. 
But when you're done, just hit that, save it to your desirable location, and you are done. Great job on creating your mug, texturing it, and generating a final render. I hope this video was enjoyable and informative to you, and I encourage you to keep honing your Blender skills. Thank you for joining me in this tutorial, and stay tuned for more content like this.